Hi everyone, welcome to All Things Creative. I'm your host, Linda Riesenberg Fissler, and I am very excited to be welcoming, welcoming Kelly Garrett to the show. Kelly is a, a writer um, with some interesting twists. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm gonna have Kelly introduce herself here uh, shortly, but um, Kelly has two books that are out on the market that you can purchase today. They're mystery, murder, um, thriller, I guess uh, you could say, with, <laughs> um, with with an interesting twist. Like I said, suspense. I don't want to. I don't want to give too much away because I want Kelly to tell us about them. Um, and then she's also worked uh, on uh, writing uh, for the TV show uh, CBS drama Cold Case. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. But hi, Kelly. Welcome to All Things Creative. Hi, Linda. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I, I I can't wait to delve into your writing process and um, all the all the neat things that have happened in your life because I, I you know I don't know how old you are and I'm not going to ask because we don't ask ages. So um, <laughs> I don't care. I'm 40. I think I look good for 40. So I tell everybody I am 40 years old. <laughs> well, there you go. I was going to say for for a pretty short life you've been packing a lot in for <laughs> for this. So. Uh, <laughs> Tell us the start off. Um, have you introduce yourself to us? What what you've been up to, and and like I said, your books and cold case and all that good stuff. Okay, so um, obviously I'm Kelly. I write uh, really funny amateur detective novels, uh, and the series is called the Detective by Day series. Uh, the first book is Hollywood Homicide. Uh, it came out in 2017. Um, it was published by Midnight Inc. and it was I was lucky enough to win the Agatha, the Anthony, the Lefty, and an Ippy Award for Best First Novel with that one. Um, and actually it was just named to BookBub's Top 100 Novels of All Time, or Crime Novels of All Time, which is really cool and surprising. Congratulations. And then the second, thank you, it was like, it's like people like John Grisham are like on that list, so it's kind of amazing to yeah. be listed there. And then um, the second book is Hollywood Ending. It came out in August of 2018. Um, it was called The Most fun book of the year by crime reads so they're just very fun lightweight almost like cozy cozy books so if you like kind of fun janet ivanovich type books um beach reads basically with a black diverse lead then that's you should probably check them out if you want to yeah so. yeah so um education you said bs in um magazine writing i yeah so i've um I've had a lot of different careers, but they've all been writing careers. So I, um, I have a undergrad degree in magazine writing, and I actually spent a couple years as a magazine editor. And then I have a uh, master's degree in screenwriting from uh, USC's film school. And so that's how I kind of got into Hollywood and working in Cold Case. And then I kind of used, I call myself a survivor. You know, after I survived, I kind of lived to tell my tale and uh, decided to kind of put some of those fun adventures and stories I've heard in kind of in these books. Mm -hmm. So that's where kind of like the idea of Hollywood homicide and Hollywood ending came from. Yeah, well, so. okay, go Trojans, because everybody out there knows I'm a USC <laughs> fan. So, <laughs> oh, all right. no, it's a, this is, I shouldn't admit this, but basically I went for grad school and I was right. about, I was like 23, 24. And so, um, I hate to say it, I wasn't super connected to like anything that was not in this film, like the film school, you know. Um, so, you know, like I never went to the games, and I used to always be, like be forget that like kids lived on campus. And I'd be like, it's Saturday. Why are all these people here? You know, like that's how disconnected I was. I was like, why are all these kids down on here right now? So, um, but yeah, I was there for two years for my master's degree, and I will be paying it off for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I can I identify with that one. I, I actually live in Ohio. It's it's it's, it's funny because um I'm sorry, yeah. but you know like obviously all this drama has been going on with like Lori Lawlin and her kids and USC, right, right. and everyone's like joking like USC is not that hard to get into, and I'm like, well actually the film school is pretty hard to get into, <laughs> so I'm like maybe undergrad, but those grad programs are not easy. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's exactly. We, um, I guess when I was 18, which is, you know, back in like 1979, 1980, you know, my plan was I was going to work for five years, get all this money together. And at the time I thought USC was a, you know, public school like UCLA. So it's like, mm. yeah, then I'm going to go out to California and I'm going to establish my residency and then I'm going to go to USC film school. And then I'm going to, 
No, I'm still surprise. Yeah, surprise. I'm still in Ohio. <laughs> so at least I'm writing books. That's good. You know, so yeah, we'll, we'll hang on to that. But uh, yeah, so cool. Very diverse background. That, it's, um, you know, I was reading through your biography. I was like, wow, this is, you know, like I said, you have packed it in for a 40 years old girl. <laughs> yes, a lot of different things. <laughs> So, so tell us a little bit about um, why you go to kind of that side of the crime. Uh, did Cold Case give you that interest or did you have that before you started writing for Cold Case? Um, no, I've always loved mysteries. Like when I was younger, I used to read like Joan Hess, Jane Jeffries, like a lot of those, you know, cozy mysteries. Um, and then when I was about 12, I discovered Sue Grafted and Kenzie Milhone. Mm -hmm. Uh, Barbara Neely with the Blanche White series. So I've always loved mysteries. Um, the problem though is I have a very overactive imagination. <laughs> like there's a James Patterson a book I read like probably when it first came out and there's like a scene in that book that still haunts me and it's been like 20 plus years, you know? And so um, like I love mysteries, but I don't, they can't be too graphic, you know, like serial killing and torture. So mm. for me, like that's why I like amateur detective novels because you can get your mystery in there, but it's also kind of a light and fun, you know? And so right. it's interesting because it's like, I always say people kind of, sometimes they um, kind of talk down on cozies, but making murder funny, is really hard. It is. And so I don't think, um, I don't think cozy writers get enough credit for what they do. So. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting because we started watching Killing Eve with Sandra Oh, mm. uh, my husband mm -hmm. and I, and it, it's one of these things where I just keep looking at it going, cause I, this is kind of like my first experience with, you know, the psychopath and it being funny. <laughs> yeah. But I like both of these actresses that are starring in it. So, um, this was one of these things where I just, every once in a while I just look over at Tom and cock my head, like really, <laughs> so, but it, it can be, it is really hard to write that it's, I can, it is. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's it's done very well, but it's just so strange for me because like I'm in the totally opposite range of I write um, es espionage mystery um, mm. and with okay. with some political intrigue. So I'm you know always very serious. <laughs> Occasionally yeah. I can get some 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 laughs in there with some of my characters, fictional characters, but it, it's just really because it's also historical. So it's it, it's. I don't know. I guess I just like the challenge of multitasking and um, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like you kind of do the same thing. So um, are, what, what are you, what are, you have a day job, right? I have a day job. Yes. I work um, in communications for a media company. Okay. So uh, it's still writing, still writing based. So okay. I stick with my theme. <laughs> so, yeah. So let's get, let's get into to what um, writing looks like for Kelly outside of work. So you go to work and, and you're, you have a commute and you get home and what, you start writing or you're too tired and you I, for the weekend? Uh, <laughs> I wish I was like, I have friends who can like, you know, like there's something on Twitter called the 5 a.m. Writers Club where people get up every morning at 5 a.m. and they write. And I wish I was that regimented. I'm so not. Um, I My favorite quote is like Dorothy Parker. I the thing is like, I hate writing. I love having written. And so I hate writing. Um, the blank page scares me. So it's literally like after I've done everything else I could possibly do, then like about eight o'clock at night, I'll like get in bed and I will finally force myself to write. But it's not, it's not a fun process for me. I love rewriting though. Like once it's on the page, I love to rewrite, but a blank page scares me, which is why I do like 25 page outlines. So, oh, okay. So yeah, we're getting a little bit into your process. So you, yeah. um, so you, you do, you start out with an outline. Yes. I, I don't, I, I, I can, I appreciate, um, mystery writers who can pants, like who don't use an outline, but <laughs> I just don't know how you could do Like, I don't know. Like I'm in all of you. Cause I don't know how you can do that. And at least I, you know, for me and I, I mind you, I will, change things in the outline I'm not married to them but right. like I have to know something you know I have to just know something so yeah and I guess I I for, for somebody that is considers himself more of a pantser I, I mm -hmm. guess I should probably like say I don't write a physical outline but okay. in my head I I write you know yeah, I kind of know where I'm going with it. I kind of know where my plot mm -hmm. twists are going to come in, what what my plot twists are. And so then I just mm -hmm. start writing a free write. And of course, everybody's just like, are you kidding me? Three, it's like my, I love free writing. 
unlike you, the white page doesn't scare me. So mm. I just love just typing anything that comes, whatever scene comes to my mind, I start typing it out. And then I worry about where I'm going to plug it in later. Um, mm. So it's kind of a, so I guess, you know, somebody told me I was a pantser. I was like, whatever, <laughs> this is my style. This is my process. Hey, if it works for you, it right. works for you. Right. Yeah. You know, but the, the downside of that is, you know, I'm not putting something out like every six months because my free rights are typically 350,000 words. So, oh my goodness. Yeah. So now I have a bunch of deleted scenes that I can also share with my, my fans or I could use mm. them in the next book or something like that. So, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. so that's kind of like my process. And then, so, so when I hear that somebody actually outlines and did you, mm -hmm. were you jokingly saying, did you say 25 page outline? No, I'm not joking. Really? Okay, so that's like, <laughs> yeah, the, no, um, word free, right. You understand that, right? <laughs> yeah, I no, Um, I think it comes from one with television writing. You have to have an outline, mm -hmm. you know, obviously because of it's like you're spending a million dollars per episode. So you can't, you have to know where you're going. Exactly. What's going to happen it has to be approved by several different people. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of have that background and I think I kind of got used to that and I kind of felt a little safety in that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I, I, and one of the things I'm doing too right now um, is, uh, writing a script so you're right you have oh, to nice. know where you're going with that kind of you know you can't just sit down and say okay i'm just going to write you know 900 pages of a script because nobody's ever going to film right. that yeah so and it, yeah. you got you got you have to too. i'm sorry it has to be tight i think that's another thing that i think helps my writing too is i'm very plot heavy because to me like in tv every scene has to move the story forward because you only get like 42 minutes so there's certain things that I think I learned in screen it's in screenwriting I learned in film school and also working in television I think definitely influences my writing so right. so I'm curious to see how that how the opposite is having you coming from a background where it's more novel writing how does that affect your your screenwriting uh well I, I we for for those of you who are listening, Kelly and I have not met in person. I um, mm -hmm. actually actually found Kelly through um, the International Thriller that that organization, the club. Oh, cool! Yeah, so that's where I found you. So so it's kind of interesting that we're getting into the conversation of our differences versus some other things. But we'll get to that. But anyway, the the um, you don't, my background, when I started writing as a kid, I was writing uh, like for favorite TV shows, just for fun. Oh, so okay. I kind of started okay. writing scripts, but not really knowing that I was writing scripts because mm -hmm. I would write them in script forms. And then okay. one of the things that I did was I actually wrote a script for Star Trek, the next generation and um, oh, nice. it got rejected, but Eric Stilwell who rejected it. Um, I actually sent it to Gene Roddenberry registered mail. <laughs> I was so brash, but anyway, so Eric Stillwell um, sent it back, but he had in this, in the rejection letter, he basically gave me everything I needed to resubmit it successfully, um, including oh, nice. agents to like contact, but stupid 22 year old me thought, oh, it's rejected. I can't write. And I stopped writing at that point. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, um, it's what so funny because you probably want to like smack yourself now that you're older and you're like, like what an opportunity like for him to do that was, right? Yeah, my head still hurts because I hit it against the wall so hard. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those things where like, you know, I was in my, um, let's see, late 40s, early 50s, I guess, early 50s mm -hmm. and found that in my painting studio because I started, I took up oil painting at that point and um, pulled that out and looked at it and then went over and like I said, hit my head against the wall a couple times and said, all right, I'm writing my first novel. And that's, that's what I did. So, oh, well, so at least you got something. It took a long time, but you got something out of it. Yes, I did. So, um, so that was my background. So have you been, have you written like from kid on, or did you just decide that you liked writing at some point later? When I was five, I told my parents I wanted to be a novelist. Well, there so, you go. Um, it just took it took a very long time because I was scared. So uh, that's why I did every other type of writing. Like I did journalism, then I did TV writing. And then finally about 20, I think around 2011, 2012, I finally got started writing the book. And it took a, it took a while 
Mm -hmm. A lot of stops and starts. Uh, But no, since I was five, so it's been a very long journey. So in your outline, do you do a lot of character development in that outline, or do you just go right into the plot heavy and the character kind of develops Um, up along the way? I... Well, with the first book, I was developing the main characters, so I did a lot. I did character work. Um, Part of it was to have it. Other part, I think, was to kind of procrastinate on writing this actual (laughs) book. Um, And then I think with the second one, I kind of definitely, I think for the second one, the idea for the plot came first, and then I figured out the character that would fit the plot, because the idea for the second book was based on a a woman who was a publicist named Ronnie Chasen, who was leaving a, uh, I think she was leaving a a premiere party for like some Christina Aguilera uh, movie. And when she left, she unfortunately um, got killed in a drive, like basically a carjacking gone wrong. Hmm. Um, And so it was like this big talk of of Hollywood at the time, just because no one knew what happened originally. and she was like a very well-known publicist. And so um, so the idea behind Hollywood Ending is a uh, publicist for a award show is leaving their kind of like their award show party, pre-party. And she gets um, she gets killed um, in an ATM, a botched AT- a robbery gone wrong in an ATM after the party. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, so like I said, I kind of knew the idea and I was like, well, how who, how can I kind of take this character and make them into something? You know, and I kind of took some other things I really, I really like just about, you know, just me. Like I love gossip. So there's a gossip element to it. <laughs> um, you know, I love, I'm fascinated with award shows. So there's a lot of award show, like insider information there too. So oh, cool. Um, yeah, so it's funny because when I started the first book, I wasn't planning on it being very Hollywood focused. Um, but then my friend was like, you know, you should just keep with this theme, you know, because I kind of that was the world I came from, you know, and it was the world I knew. And so. Right. So I did. So are the character are there characters in both books that are or is are they two different? It's not. a No, series it's the ever. same. It's the same. It is a series. It's the same. Her name is Dana Anderson. I describe her as a, a semi broke mega famous black actress. Um, and then the other characters, she has two best friends. Um, one of them, I based on the uh, Olsen twins, the idea of imagine if like the Olsen twins, like Mary Kate and Ashley, mm-hmm. after Full House, one wanted to quit and the other wanted to keep going. And so the idea that you don't want to be famous, but you look just like the most famous person in the world, like how would you react to that? Yeah. So that's the idea behind Emmy. So she kind of like is a hermit who's really good at computer stuff because she never leaves her house. Um, she has another friend, Sienna, who uh, is trying to set a world record for wearing red every day. And so you kind of see how that comes about in the first book. Um, and then there's a, for her, kind of like her foil, she has a, because uh, there's no police in my book, so she has a uh, a character who is a, um, uh, basically a private detective who's also looking into the case of the first book. Oh. And then um, I kind of, I call myself being cute, so with a lot of cozies, you know, like the love interest is a cop. Mm-hmm. So my love interest is a guy who plays a cop on television, because I was like, I can't do a cop, but I will do a little Hollywood twist on that. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds really interesting. So I assume like um, there's a lot of, it, would you would you like classify it as like a film noir, noir type of? No, it's a cozy. Like someone described it as saying it's not, it's not, um, it's not like, you know, the cozies in like Chinatown. Like, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the LA of Chinatown. It's, it's a very funny, lightweight look at um, lightweight, not lightweight, lightweight look at how Hollywood, kind of how absurd Hollywood is. So great. Yeah. So it's, is there anything that you know, without going any further into like the outline and things like that? So you have your outline done um, mm-hmm. and then you get over your fear of the white paper <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and uh, you, for days, do you go over in your head? Okay. I'm going to start it here. And this is going to be the first sentence. I mean, I just have like this picture in my mind that you start typing this thing out and then you start hitting the backspace <laughs> or, or something. No, I think, 
Um, one, I actually, uh, it's funny you were saying free thought earlier. So I do journaling and what I'll do is I'll just free thought into my journal and figure out how scenes, what kind of beats have to be in the scenes. Because like I said, from the, my TV background, right. you start the scene as late as you can, you end it as quick as you can, and it should move the story forward. So I kind of like will break down each scene and like what, what information, what key information we should get out of that, you know, um. And if I have, like, funny, like, lines, like, I'm a big dialogue person, so if I have a funny line I want to include, I will, uh, like, put that in there as a reminder, so. Yeah, that's the hardest thing. I mean, I, um, I don't know if you want to talk about this very much, but the writing software that is out there for, um, geez, I'm drawing a blank, final, final Draft, um, I I bought a version of Final Draft so that I could start mm-hmm. to turn my novels into to scripts, and mm-hmm. it's it's really kind of interesting because they have a beat board and they have you know all this different stuff and I'm like what the heck's a beat board? So Kelly, what's a beat board? <laughs> what's um, I don't, I never use, I use movie magic. I oh, what I want to okay. say. So here's a, an example. So on Cold Case, um. We had a writer's room, which is basically all the writers on the show would sit in a conference room and discuss what happens in the episode. Mm-hmm. And we would write what happened down on a whiteboard. So, like, all the all the scenes and, like, the plot points were on a, 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 a whiteboard. So, I'm assuming that the beat board's probably, like, the final draft electronic version of, like, the whiteboard that you see. Yeah, it's and very like, similar. You know, um, think of it more like index cards. So index cards yeah. would push up on a cork board or something, but yeah. White yeah. I, 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 I love, I know people who use them. I've never used index cards. I think when I first started writing the first book, I was used to that whiteboard. So I got a whiteboard, but I kind of stopped doing that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, it's so funny. I wrote my first book in movie magic screenwriting software because I was used to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then cause like what it, there's, what is, what is the one that people use now for novel writing that like, everyone uses? It's so confusing. Oh, um, well, there's oh. Wattpad. There's um, Scrivener. Oh, it's, it's a software. One. Scrivener. It's Scrivener. Scrivener. Yeah. Like, I've tried to use Scrivener, like, twice, and I'm like, I don't – this is too complicated for me. Oh, yeah. So, um, But someone once said that I, I, I made um, Word Scrivener because I set up my document where I can, like, I have it where like you can move chapters around like there's certain ways you can set up a document in Mm -hmm. word Mm -hmm. um, that you can kind of have the side thing where you can jump to chapters. You can move them around really easy because you just do different heading settings. Right. Um, And so someone's like, oh, Kelly, you just Scrivenered word. I was like, oh, okay. But um, I still was like, I don't need to buy Scrivener, do I? Because I just Scrivenered word. So I just use word now. Yeah, I use word as well. Um, Mainly because I think it's a lot more flexible. I, I can't have somebody else's thought process, process driving how I'm writing, if that's a yeah. kind of way. And then there was, there's one that it might be, still might be Scrivener, I don't know, but what scared me away from, if it is Scrivener, what scared me away from it is like, you could say, okay, I'm going to write for two hours, and then you get down to like the last 10 seconds or whatever, and the thing counts down, and it's like, oh, no. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm no. not going there, <laughs> It's not good. Yeah, no. Yeah. Not, yeah not. Although I, um, I've been trying this. Have you heard? Like you've heard of Pomodoro, the Pomodoro method. It's not even for writing, but the idea is that you focus on one task for 25 minutes. Mm. Then you take a five minute break and then you do it again for another 25 minutes. Um, and so I've been trying to do that. And so it's been, sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I kind of, it's kind of like basically sprinting, but mm-hmm. it's more, I guess, you know, organized, like, okay, it's going to be 25 minutes and then, and then a break. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I've you, done that. Yeah. I don't know. See, but, uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I like to write in really long sprints. So or I should say like what, two hours. No, I like writing for like eight hours. <laughs> so. Okay, so basically, it's, you're just like you're writing all day. Basically, it's like a bit of sprint, it's like a marathon. Yeah, there's there's a bit of a little bit of difference between you and I. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. it's like um I don't I I I resigned from Procter and Gamble to start painting and writing. So wow. um yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Well, that's one reason why I live in Ohio. So <laughs> you like if I'm painting, uh, like I'll teach painting class on Tuesday, so that'll be like. You know, I have two classes that I teach on that day. So that's like the eight hour day of painting. And then, you know, I, I would love, I would love to spend an eight hour day on writing, but typically I can only get about um, three to four hours in um, mm-hmm. before my husband's like, 
can you get up from the computer? <laughs> can you come out and do this? So, um, yeah, so he's retired. So we're both at home. It was a lot. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a lot easier. It was a lot easier to write when um, he was actually still working. But I can, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, I, there's this part of me that's really frustrated that I can't write for as long as I want to write. I don't have mm. a problem of, and maybe it's because I'm self-published and I don't have people looking over my shoulder and, you know, I, I just put it out there for the world to consume and someday hopefully they'll find me, but you know, it's one of those things where um, it's, 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 it feels like it's like you're a, like this little like boat in the middle of the ocean, oh, like, Hey, I'm over yeah. here. Doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's interesting. It's, it's, it, the funny part of it was I, it's, I told, um, one of the other authors I had on the show, you know, so I quit PNG, uh, resigned from PNG to become a, a, an artist. And then I, somebody in the trade gave me one of their trade surveys and it came out as like 4.2 million artists in America alone. That's not even the mm -hmm. whole world. So it's a bigger number when you <laughs> add in Europe and, and other places. So I'm like, so they're going, oh, great. So I left this, you know, small pond of corporate America consumer products um, heaven or whatever and went into this thing where there's 4.2 million starving artists <laughs> out there. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, oh, okay, well, I'll go write. And then there's probably about that or more writers out there in the world. Oh, yeah, and they're all on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, they're all on Twitter at 5 a.m., right? <laughs> so, yes, exactly. Yeah. So. Um, probably, I, you know, I have to say that you probably don't have any regrets though, right? In terms of what? Um, being a writer in general. No, it's what I, it's like, I just feel like my dream is to write books and just the idea that I got a book published is amazing to me. Yeah. And then to have it have been people actually like, it, it's just kind of like, that's even more amazing to me. So, and then to have two books out, that's like even more amazing to me. So I'm right. just kind of, it's funny because I think, you know, publishing, I, I help, I, um, I interact with a lot of emerging writers who don't have our, our agents yet or publishing deals yet. Mm -hmm. And I try to explain to them that, you know, like you have to, publishing is brutal. It is. Um, it makes, it makes no sense. You know, um, it's just as much about luck as it is about talent. You know, I always think it's funny when people act like, oh, well, I'm successful because of X, Y, Z. And it's like, you're successful probably because of just as much because of luck. You're lucky. Mm -hmm. And so um, I try to say to them, like, you know, try to enjoy the small victories. Like if an agent, an agent, you know, wants, wants to read your full manuscript. Yes. And you, to get an offer. Yes. You know, to have an editor, even give you an R and R, like just to try to enjoy those moments because they're so few and far between, you know. Right. So yeah. Because a lot of them are it's like funny how you were saying earlier, like when you were twenty two, you got that that what you thought was that rejection and you thought you did you you're a horrible writer. It's like so many writers are like that. There's mm -hmm. like that imposter syndrome is so real. Mm -hmm. You know, and um I think it's because we think of it's a certain formula when it's not, it's so much about luck. So yeah, it's been interesting as a couple of my fans have come back and said, well, I want to read your Star Trek, you know, Next Generation script. I'm like, no, they own the rights to that. You know, it's like, they, I mean, they don't own the rights to that particular script, but they own the rights to all those characters. And it's like, I can't exactly go out and publish that. And explaining yeah. that whole thing to them, you know, was kind of an interesting um, <laughs> exercise. <laughs> Let's put it that way. You know, it's interesting. I, it's not, not, this is not saying that they are like that, but I think a lot of people don't cons realize that um, like writing and art, that's something that people sh can get paid for and should get paid for. Mm -hmm. Do you know? And I think yeah. um, like, I feel like, remember, like a couple like months ago or weeks ago, there was like this whole big thing where like there was that guy who had that website that was basically had everyone's books on there free and people just didn't understand why people were upset about. It. And it's like, because I worked hard on that mm -hmm. and, you know, I should, pe writers should be compensated. And I think people think because writers, anyone technically can put words on a page and form a sentence, they think writing's easy. And good writing just looks easy, you know? So, um, so it's interesting, you know? And yeah. I, something I had to realize myself was like, I had to, I have to treat this like a business. And I remember I, um, I had, I was teaching um, an online writing class and like, I would give, I would give them really good detailed notes. And after the class was about to be over, one of my students said to me like, oh, well, are you, are you still going to give us notes? You know, and like the assumption was that I was going to give, give my, give my talent and time freely to you, you know, and I had to kind of just be like, well, if you would like to, you know, pay me, then yes, I would be happy to do that, you know, but that was, it was hard for me to even 
to say that, mm -hmm. you know, but, it, but the idea of trying to treat, treat this artistic endeavors as, you know, something that you should be compensated for. I think it's something that we all, we, it's could be tricky for us, but we need to do so. Yeah, I, absolutely. And one of the things that, that I find interesting in, in the conversation is, you know, a lot with the self-publishing because we don't have agents and things like that, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, give a book away for free. And I'm like, why, okay. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like, if I give it away for free, then they're going to think the second one's going to be free. And they're going to think the third right. one's going to be free. And, you know, as I always, one of the things that I always say is, you know, free um, doesn't mean that they're loyal fans. You know, I have a group right. of people that are waiting for me to release the second book as free. Um, Cause I thought, well, okay, I'll try it their way release the first book is free a couple times a year, but you know, I don't see that converting over to them buying a second and third book. Um, right. They and, get it because it's free. Yeah. They're, they're waiting for it to become free. Now the, the people that have paid for my books, you know, are the ones that are writing me and saying, when's book five coming out, you know, and it's like, wow. and don't mess with this character. Cause I really love him the way he is <laughs> like, mm -hmm. no, sorry. I'm going to mess with that character. Cause you told me not to. So, <laughs> you know? so that kind of that kind of thing happens but yeah so i want to talk a little bit about your covers um oh okay they have a very great like a graphic novel feel to it mm -hmm. um the novel isn't a graphic novel though right no it's not yeah it's so cozy. she said it's cozy and yeah so it was kind of interesting when i saw it i was like oh you know this whole conversation about graphic novels now being the hit thing um Doing something like that would scare me <laughs> mentally. I mean, well, I um, so I I don't self-publish. I had I had a publisher, mm -hmm. and so um, I did not, I did not. They were the ones who were the lead on those covers. On I covers. think they're gorgeous. Yeah, I think yeah. So too. what happened is um, like a lot of cozies or amateur detective novels usually don't have a like a face on them. You know, mm -hmm. if, if at most they might have a body part, and so um, my book actually the original title. Well, the second title that I sold it under was called, uh, oh my God, what was it called? Payday. It was called Payday. Mm -hmm. okay. And so um, their first round of covers, it was a more traditional cover where it was like you could just see her leg getting out of a car. Mm -hmm. And um, and then my publisher decided that they wanted to actually make Dana the focus. They wanted to have her on the cover just as the focus, which is great because mm -hmm. it doesn't happen a lot in Cozy's also because it was a black woman. And now there's a few more but when i was first published there were like no like maybe one i think alexia gordon was the, the only black woman who was publishing black a black woman cozy series and so um that idea that they want to actually kind of not hide from that but kind of embrace that really just i was so happy about that mm -hmm. and then they um i'd given them the name of this um off this illustrator who we found on instagram and um that was i think their idea with him was to kind of make it very based on his style, more graphic design looking. And so I just, I loved, I love both my covers, especially the first one. Mm -hmm. I just think it's just like, it's every time I, I see it, it just makes me so happy. It's just cause I think it's so it's breathtaking and it's so different mm -hmm. than what you see and expect from uh, cozies. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like them. I think they're beautiful too. So coming from my art, I can take no art. credit, but I will still say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm I'm just really kind of curious um, mm -hmm. because you mentioned that you know it's a black character, and mm -hmm. do you get a lot of I'm going to say crossover? Do you have a lot of um, Caucasian fans, white fans, however you want to say it, um, Latinos, I, Hispanics? Do you know? I, I, I don't mean I don't keep track. I think so. I I know that there are um I think it's great because as a I've like I've been reading mystery since I was probably ten or eleven. Mm -hmm. And so I think it would it was hard because I loved I love mystery so much, especially I'm a Richard Detective, and to not see myself or just to see myself relegated as like that sassy best friend who's always so stereotypically like, Hey girlfriend like you know, like it's just, <laughs> just like it's so heartbreaking for me. Yeah. And so um so I do have, I have, I've had black women who like will write me and be like, I'm so happy to finally see a black woman in a, this, type, this genre I love. But then I have had older white women who are write me, write me and they say, oh, I love your book too. You know, and I think, great. I think that was my goal was, was to make it an accessible book for everyone where, you know, cause obviously like we're all people, like, you know, like I don't like that, but like that idea that 
there's she's definitely a black woman but it's not like it's this i it's not nothing's wrong with an issue book my book's not an issue an issue book and i kind of i i think that that's important too i always say like white people have they have their funny books they have their serious books they have their good books they have their bad books and i feel like they expect for us if I'm a, I'm a black woman, like your character has to be black for a reason. Like, no, she doesn't. I'm not black for a reason. I'm black, you know? And so I think people of color, we should also be able to have our funny books and our serious books and our issue books and our books are just a character just happens to be black just because she's black or she happens to be gay or she happens to be Latinx or whatever it is, you know? And so, um, so I, I purposely wrote a book where the characters just happens to be black, you know, and she's definitely, has certain elements of being a black woman in there just because that's what I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not like her main focus in like what's driving the story. So. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I love the way you said that. That was, that was wonderful. <laughs> so um, yeah. You. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it, as a white writer, it's mm-hmm. very, like I have um, a really wonderful, I love my, my Washington DC police chief in, in the first book is african-american and he's based on a mm-hmm. friend that i mm-hmm. knew at procter and gamble and, and i loved him to death and he, he had this booming bass boy you know bass voice and whenever i picked up the phone i'd hear that voice and it was just like send chills down my spine it was so wonderful it's so you know it was it's i would say it's like very hard for me unless i think of a person of color that i know um you know, for me to, to actually write that character because there's so much unknown mm-hmm. to me about yeah. living that way. So I think, you know, that what's the old adage that they always say writers write about things that they know. So it makes, yeah. sense, you know, so. Yeah. I, I think it's tricky. I think it's a tricky thing where it's like, I think all books should have more diversity, but yes, you're yeah. going to have to, especially if you're writing, if you're writing a character, the lead who's of color, you have to do the research. Exactly. You know, and I think there's some writers who don't want to do that. They want to just like, oh, like a pat myself on the back and have a color who, character who's black. But they don't want to research what, like what, what it means to be a black person in America. Because there's definitely, black culture is definitely American culture, but there's mm-hmm. certain, there, certain and things that are going to be different. Like my brother driving down the street and sees a cop is going to react differently than a 60 year old white woman driving down the street and see a cop. You know what I'm saying? Like small yeah, things like that. Yeah. Um, that I think you have to, you have to put forth, but like just how people research. I don't know if you want to, I'm hoping that if you have a story set in I don't know, like China or whatever, or like, you know, you're going to research that. Or if you have a cop character, you're going to research, you know, cop, like, police procedure hopefully you'll yeah. be willing to research p- people of color of the character that mm-hmm. in, of your character as well and i think it's funny because there's like the whole idea of sensitivity readers which is um having a person of that culture read your book for issues some people want to scream censorship but it's like you don't have a problem like you know with like a police officer or something like that reading your book but when it because it's race and race is such a hot topic all of a sudden it's a, it's censorship which is mm-hmm. not at all so. yeah or being marked explicit which this show will be marked now since we're talking about this <laughs> <laughs> by me that's the interesting thing is i don't mark it explicit but no oh, so wait, is it really going to be explicit because yeah. of this topic that's probably i think like we should start cursing now yeah there you go that would make... fully embrace explicit <laughs> go ahead <laughs> no but yeah. I'm, seriously I, I mean i've gone back and looked out on itunes and a couple of my podcasts have been listed as explicit and it's because some of them i, I would be talking with like master artists and then we would start talking about you know hello yeah i'm sorry you still here kelly yeah, I lost you for a second. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I would be talking with a master artist, uh, painter, and and maybe we would start talking about, you know, how to draw the human body. And the next thing I know, that one's marked, you know, explicit. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so I'm like, so, literally, yeah, like so rolling my eyes right now. Yeah, it's amazing what they, you know, what they consider. I mean, I'm asking from the standpoint of somebody that doesn't know. So that's why, you know, I, I would ask the questions that I ask. So. So kind of interesting from from that standpoint, how we all, you know, look at censorship and different things like that. But so, yeah, so it's it's really, you know, it's interesting talking with you about this because there's just so many different um, things that we can go in and, and talk about. Um, so when you were working on Cold Case, I'm assuming, were you living in California at the time? I did. I lived in L.A. for eight years, actually. Okay. 
And how did, how did, how did it, I mean, I, I assume you graduated from USC and then applied for positions or? No. So what happens, it's kind of like um, if you are trying to sell a book with an agent. So what happens is you get an agent um, and then it's that agent's job is to get you a job. And so whereas um, it's like your agent's job to get you a book deal, it's your agent's job to get you a staffing position. Ah. And so what happens is they have what they call, like you have a sample script. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of like your resume or like so what they call a showrunner who's kind of like the CEO of the show. Mm -hmm. It's always a writer. Um, they will like read your script. If they like you, they'll bring you in for an interview. And if they like the interview, then they will hire you on staff for the show. So. Oh, great. Okay. And the script's never, just to be clear, the script is never uh, for that show. So like I didn't submit a cold case script to work on cold case. I submitted a script for the show called The Closer. So that's the thing too, is like, it's not like you're not submitting a script for that show. Okay. Interesting. So then you, and then it's like, this is always, I have a, a friend who is in LA and is a writer, screenwriter, director, and producer. Um, his name's George Gallo. Don't know if you know him or not. Um, but, but George and I have a number of conversations. We're, we're very good friends and he's also an artist. So we have wide ranging conversations. And, um, when I guess a couple things, like I told him I was going to take my books and turn them into scripts. And he says, okay, well, send, a, send me them as you get them done. And he's going to be kind of like mentoring me, which is really cool. But oh, nice. yeah, so it's one of these kind of things where it's like, um, I, okay, he gives some, some basic things you need to know. One page of script equals one minute, you know, That's so different things like that. <laughs> so like you were saying, it's 42 pages, 42 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then it, since cold case is on regular TV, we'll call it regular TV, there's ads that get inserted in to each one of those. Yeah, so that's, all... that's where those 18 minutes come into their, their, all, their commercial breaks. Right. And then, so you have to also figure out in your scene, right, when that break's coming. Yeah. It's so, called an act out. Yeah, an act out. Yeah. So, so all these cool things that we're, <laughs> we're learning. Here. It's interesting because I, um, so the act out that's like that you said, the idea behind it and act out was back when people actually had to watch commercials that you wanted to end the scene in that act before the commercial break, that last scene on such a high point that people would stay and sit through like three or four minutes of commercials for things they already are going to buy anyway. So they can just like see what happens next. And so um, I kind of actually use that for my chapters. I call them chapter outs, even though that's not what they are. Yeah. I made the term up, but the idea of ending my chapter on a kind of a high point. So like the idea is like, oh, I'm just going to read one more chapter, you know, like that. To right. Me is Turn one more page. Good, a good book. Yeah. I just have to read one more chapter. So that's what I, my goal is. I don't know if it always happens, but my goal is definitely to have end each chapter on a high point. So. Yeah. And, and it's one of those things too. Like, um, I think you know, when I listen to you talk, you think in terms of scenes as well, like, you know, yes. each chapter or whatever. Um, and and I found I found some authors that don't actually think that way as scenes, but um, you know, really? actually think of them as chapters and you know, therefore yeah. they're following their outline so strictly that, you know, each chapter has its its um whatever outlined action of what's gonna happen. But I I do tend to I, I tend to think I think more like you in that, you know, okay, the scene's coming to an end, but yet I want them to turn the page. So what's the next thing that, you know, I want to lead them on with so that they, mm -hmm. they turn into that page. And then, um, I don't know, have you read any of, um, Ken Follett's work? So, um, let's, I'm trying to think, well, he's got the century tr trilogy, which are like 900 page books is the big one, but the, the one that, um, got me mm. interested in, in watching or reading his his stuff uh was eye of the needle and then pillars of the earth are two of his titles okay. and he writes interestingly enough but he'll have a chapter and then in the chapter and especially in the the trilogy series he um takes a chapter and then inside the chapter are like other chapters so he's he's tracing the life of five families in the century tr trilogy ireland england germany uh, Russia and America or where the five families live. So each chapter takes you further with one of those family members in that, in that country. Okay. 
And, okay. And it starts prior to World War One and goes all the way up for a hundred years. That's why it's the tri century trilogy, um, following oh, wow. these families. So, you know, I started reading that and I was, <laughs> I was sitting there thinking, oh, now that's kind of interesting. So I've kind of patterned my chapters that way, where even though I think in scenes, I'm also thinking of, okay, I have to talk, I have to deal with um, one character in here, you know, all of my characters in here. So I keep moving this, their storylines on, you know, and keep people interested. Like, you know, I can't forget about my assassin. I have to tell people what's going on with right. him, you know, that kind of stuff. Do, do you, do you kind of see the same thing happening in, in your books? Well, my books are first person, so I don't have to worry about that. Oh, good stuff. Good I can't even imagine you. having to do all that. <laughs> yeah. I write first person past. So, um, so I don't have to worry about, maybe that's why I don't write third person, but I don't, everything <laughs> I do is just like what my character knows. So. Ah, cool. Yeah, now that, believe me, when you get to where I am on book five, you wish you would have written it in first person. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's it, I mean, you, I have like probably 300 line timeline going in Excel with everybody's birth dates and everything on it just so I can keep them all straight. I mean, it's, it's pretty complicated. So I guess that's probably why I need an eight hour period to write in as well. So. <laughs> So, so, um, what's up next for you? What, what do you, are you just kind of going to have a speaking so engagements I, or, um, I have an, when is this coming out? Uh, this will be launched probably about Monday or Tuesday next week. Oh, perfect. So I have a, um, event in Princeton, New Jersey next, next Saturday at the cloak and dagger. Okay. Uh, I'll be having kind of discussion with some other mystery writers and signing some books. And then on, um, I think Sunday, there's something called the cozy mystery crew. They're having their anniversary party at the Facebook party. So I'll be participating in that and giving away a book. Um, cool. yeah. And then I think in May, it's so funny. I, I never think I'm busy, but then I have a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> and then I think in May, I'm going to be at a Barnes and Noble in like Monmouth County just to do like a mystery read, like readers. Oh, cool. Writers event too. So, yeah. yeah. So, and is all that on your website? You know what? I should, I should put it on by Monday. Um, I think, <laughs> let me look. I'm like, I'm like the worst. I'm like the worst when it comes to my events. I know I have the cloak and dagger one on there because I actually put it on there. Um, I think I don't, I should probably put those Facebook events on there too, huh? Yep. <laughs> You're inspiring me, Linda. Thank you. But yeah. I have, I have the, um, I have the cloak and dagger one and I guess I'll put the, I'll put the mystery, I'll put the Facebook one on there yeah. too. So. Put that all on there. So, and then tell us, yeah. um, your website is Kelly Garrett. It's, yeah. Yeah. But it's, my name is uh, K E L L Y E. And then it's Garrett G A R R E T T. Uh, so it's like Kelly E Garrett, I guess you could say, but it's yeah. just my, my name has an E at the end of it. So. Okay. So cool. So yeah, everybody go out and check out Kelly's website and she'll have all her appearances on there. Hopefully yeah. there Tuesday, if not, there is don't a get mad if I don't though, <laughs> I, say, if not, I think there is a contact, uh, yeah, my contact information. So you can always write her or find her. You're on Facebook. I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. So, so you can find get all those you can shout out to her there. Yes. Um, yeah. so Kelly, thanks so much for spending some time with us. I want to give you an opportunity though, to talk about something that we may not have covered, but that you wanted to get out there. Is there anything? Oh, I'm trying to, th I think we covered everything that I wanted to kind of talk about. I think, um, I think one of my big things is diversity in crime fiction and making it more inclusive. Um, so we have a group now called crime writers of color. Um, I started it with, with me and Walter Mosley and, um, Gigi Pondian. And uh, right now we have over 135 uh, people who write crime fiction who are of color uh, and they're from all different areas of their career where like, so we have like the Walter Mosley, Sujata Masis who have been, you know, doing this for 20 years and winning awards for it. And then also we have people who don't have agents yet who are just starting out. And so we do have a Twitter account, which is crime W O C um, on Twitter. And then we also have a Facebook page. So if you do want to, if you're like a mystery writer, a reader rather, and you do want to kind of expand your reading horizons to be more diverse, definitely um, follow those two accounts. Yeah, so. great. 
So yeah, so like I said, I was so glad that that we've hooked up and um, please keep in touch um, yes, and just please. drop me emails from time to time or whatever. <laughs> and um, if I have any questions, I certainly know I'm, I'm where I can go ask <laughs> some. Um, luckily, <laughs> if, if, if I decide that, you know, to bring in, make my books a little more diverse, um, you know, hopefully I can uh, call on you to kind of help me with that. So. <laughs> Yes, I will help you. Yeah, yeah. So, and and I'll make it worth your while. So. <laughs> oh, hey, I, I'll really help you that way. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, that it's been really, really great talking with you. I'm glad we we've hooked up. I'm glad we've had an opportunity to talk. And um, you know, thank you so much for your time because I know it it is precious. So, well, thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, it was fun. So, okay. Fun. So, everyone out there, uh, next. Art chat will be with a master artist. Um, I'm still trying to nail that down. So I will uh, let you know, please keep in touch via Facebook. And um, it, you know, it will always appear in your iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify feeds um, when this does get published and when the next one comes up. So uh, more to come on that and uh, also be announced in the newsletters. Um, so again, uh, if you wanna know more about Kelly Garrett, please go out to her website, Kelly K-E-L-L-Y-E-G-A-R-R-E-T-T dot com. And she'll be um, very happy to hear from you, I'm sure. So mm -hmm. um, thank you all so much. Thanks for listening to All Things Creative. And we will talk to you soon. Bye.